All right, welcome guys to a interview video. This time we'll be speaking to a friend of ours. His name is E Mini OS Futures Trader. Hi. Welcome, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Jay. Of course, for most people, you know, everyone's always curious what gets you into trading. You know, what is your background? Well, you know, to be honest, I think a lot of traders kind of like start with uh, a background of like finance. Everyone wants to kind of like, you know, study economics and all that. So that's kind of my my take of everything. I kind of I studied in finance. I actually worked in 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 banks and in finance industry at least for the last fifteen years. Um, the way I really got into stocks and you know the stock market is I had a co cool, coworker cool at uh, one of the grocers I worked at when I was in college. So the guy would come up every day and kind of like explain what he did. And for me, it was just numbers and stock market wasn't really something I knew about. So when he was mentioning in the stocks and, you know, how addicted he was to like his portfolio, watching everything and kind of like day trading on a daily basis. That's how I think I got into it, too. And then in 2008, you know, when everyone was running to the bank with all the major financial crises, you know, the stock markets were crashing at 50, 60 percent that year. Uh, I was in the industry, I was working at a bank, and I was like really seeing how stock market affects everything, you know, economy and all that is kind of like linked into each other. And then especially a quantitative easing that came up in 2008, I was just like, the time to be in the stock market, you know, and I, I always explain this with a lot of friends when we talk about finances, it's like back then if I had put all my savings into the stock market, I would have been up like 2,000%, I think, back since 2008. But uh, back then, I actually bought a property. And, you know, it's, it's how it is. Stock market is where people make a lot of money, and that's how people lose a lot of money too, right? I mean, of course, shoot. That time was what? Like going into depressions of some sorts? No, no, that was... It was uh, basically the major, you know, the collapse of, you know, Lim Brothers, the collapse of everything, you know, <laughs> it was, it was like brand new to me because back then I'm still like in just studying in finance and then I'm seeing these guys, clients running to the banks because their portfolios are down like 50%, like seeing that panic being like there live, it totally got me into wanting to like understand how this whole thing worked, you know. And so I think for recent traders, they kind of think that what happened in 2020 was something mm -hmm. similar for themselves. Cause I mean like, you know, they were probably of age to trade by then. Yeah. How definitely. did you fare during that period of time? Well, well, 2020, it was a period where, you know, the volatility was tremendous and me not, I'm not saying I don't like volatility, but I know that when there's like extreme volatility, I mean, us as human beings, or we could, we're, we're not, you know, we're not equipped to trade that, right? It's, you know, you, you can't really expect to have easy gains when volatility is super high like that. So I, I mean, I kind of like missed a lot of good trading days because basically NASDAQ was doing like a hundred point moves within a minute, you know, that kind of volatility is not, you, a human being cannot, can't trade that. So I kind of like stayed, stayed aside. Most of my portfolios, actually, I had already sold like most of my personal stocks and stuff that I have in my retirement account. I had, I had sold most of everything in 2019. It was just, is it luck? Is it just, I mean, I was just planning to like restart in 2020, you know? And to be honest, I kind of missed a good chunk of 2020 because the volatility was tremendously high. And how does that compare? I mean, with a lot of people, mm -hmm. You know, we live in a few time where margins were so accessible yeah. that anyone could could trade that moment. They were raised, sure, but overall, it's nothing like I'm assuming back when you might have started trading. Yeah, well, the way I started trading back in 20, 2006 when I had initially first opened my brokerage account, and uh, I don't know if I can really give any names, but there's this one major, you know, broker that's known pretty much with everyone. And uh, back then you had to put up like 30, 40, 50 K depending on each broker to be able to trade at least one ES contract. And it was, it was terrible. <laughs> I, I basically 
was able to just, and we didn't have micros back then, right? Uh, let's not forget, we're talking about 20, 2006 here. So, I mean, just basic brokerage accounts being opened at that time, it was really complicated. And it, especially here in Canada, since I live in Canada, we didn't have like 10, 15, 20 brokers, you know? We basically had a couple of few brokers and you had to really put a, a certain amount to be able to trade. I think it was like 30 to 40K, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, yeah. I'm sure a lot of people got lucky with the fact... I mean, it came right on time for that 2020 fall. Because I think it was like 2019 that Microfutures had come out. Yeah. I mean, uh, I think to, nowadays, for like traders who really want to learn, especially with low risk, the micros are perfect, right? Uh, you, if you want to learn and kind of like, you know, have some kind of capital invested and, you know, start learning how to trade futures, micros are perfect. It's just that I, I, I don't think uh, uh, a, a trader who would have opened accounts in 2006 would have been able to go through 2020. Uh, 2020. Like uh, 2020 was just tremendously volatile. I mean, I don't know a lot of good traders who had who made money in 2020. If I speak to like maybe the top 20, 30 traders that I know that I've been able to meet uh, throughout these years, I, I, I can't remember one that actually made good money in 2020 because everyone was everyone was kind of scared scared because this whole pandemic thing shutting down economies this is kind of like a one time in a lifetime kind of situation you know i mean yeah for sure i mean that 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 sort of volatility hadn't died down pretty much at all i would think it kind of just kept things at a new i guess like a new level yeah, I mean, if you just look on a chart, because I have like recordings of my domes from 2020, and if you were just to look at a chart or anything, the market went down. It was like red candles after red candles after red candles. It was like at least 10 or 11 days of, you know, huge volatility. And especially, I think I had maybe seen one time where the market had done, uh, you know, when it hits the extremes overnight there. I can't remember the word, wording now, uh, the limit, when it hits the limits, you know, I mean, I I think I saw that once in 2013, if I'm not mistaken, or 2011 with the yuan or the like. There was like a issue with China, China back then, uh, the economy and everything. And then 2020, we had like three, four days of that. You know, that was like that's unbelievable. Never kind of I don't I I know traders who have traded for the last 30, 40 years, and they had basically not seen that kind of volatility. So knowing these many individuals, and mm -hmm. you know. Ha had any of them ever given a chance to mentor you or have you had any mentors? I mean, I, I, the way I see the word mentor is like any trader could be a mentor of mine. I mean, I, we could all kind of learn things from each other, right? So uh, in the last, you know, since 2006, I had one ma one main mentor who, who traded stocks and, and, and futures. And, but again, back then, if you evaluate the way trading was it was ma mainly technical analysis candlestick trading so i've had a lot of mentors I, I could say i've at least had 10 15 that kind of like brought me new ideas uh how to tweak little stuff that you know and then i kind of took ev everything from all these guys and tweaked it into my own style and then now for, at least for a good what is it at least for, for a good 10 years now i've been in like order flow market profile uh, you know, trying to really maintain one style that kind of fits, and then you know, there's always little tweaking that you could do with uh, with the kind of market you have, the sentiment, the volatility, all that kind of affects it. But of course, I've had a lot of mentors. And what market do you tend to trade on? I think ES and Nasdaq is like my go-to market. Uh, to be honest, I had a good period where I traded a lot of the bonds because. The bonds were kind of like, okay, it's super slow kind of thing. And now with all the central bank activity, the interest rates going on, uh, going up in the last six months here, the bonds have kind of been like another interest now. They, it's kind of been another market that I, I try to trade on a daily basis in my, in my brokerage account. In my brokerage account. And I think uh, ES, NASDAQ, and bonds are the main three that I have. The domes that I have are these three. I mean, I could trade a couple of times on food per day, but I think that mastering one or two good instruments and then having a couple of trade setups with those is totally enough. 
And so then, when like you're starting out, we'll say with like, maybe one lot, at what point do you begin to start shifting into using bigger size? Well, one thing is when you're trading on Dome and you're watching ES and NASDAQ, let's say this is the example that came up now, uh, you see NASDAQ kind of like, you know, has this tremendous upward momentum, let's say. It's, it's been doing like 5, 10, 15 points in a row. The correlations between the indices, indices is one key measure that I think a lot of traders really don't uh, use enough. Uh, I mean, having one lot on ES and then having NASDAQ that's just, you know, still continue, continuing to go up, even if it's like small movements, that kind of gives you that possibility. I'm just giving you like a very clear, simple example where that gives you another chance to maybe add another one on your ES. And even if the ES trade is like against you, maybe three, four ticks, you still have an opportunity either to close that trade with a break even or perhaps go get four, eight, ten ticks on it. You understand? So that's the kind of correlations I, I watch for. And especially if, um, you know, they're really well correlated because there are days where NASDAQ is like doing something totally different. ES is just in range bound. So when they're really correlating well, that's a great example of how you could size up and go get. And I think, again, size is very relative because a lot of traders will start with one and then they can go up to three, four, five. That's kind of my style. I like to keep it to like three to five lots. I rarely start with three or five, but there are days where it's tremendously um, one-sided. So those days are when I could gradually start with a three lot. And then it, I know that I can go get at least four, six ticks on my first or second lot, uh, on my first, first, first lot, basically. And then I could add to it if I see the overall, overall momentum with me. And if it's really like back and forth chop, that's where I'll size down. And so, of course, you know, it's good that you size down when you find those kind of moments that don't work well for you. But what helped you sort of embrace this focus on controlling that risk? I mean, the first thing I kind of, I mean, I think that it's, it's, uh, it's really like something that most traders say. Uh, I think the trade idea comes from a scalp, right? Like initially you're planning to just take a couple of scalps. And I think starting the day, let's say like really beginning the, the, the session, uh, I'll go in with one lot and I'll have like tight stops, you know, I'll, I'll have a four to six tight uh, tick stop on EAS just to test myself, you know, just to see if, you know, I'm consistent with what the market's doing. Uh, am I just like putting orders in like random areas? It's kind of my way to test my awareness to see if really I'm, I'm really, you know, aware of what the market's doing. And I try to keep the bias really separate. Uh, you know, you can have a bias coming into the day, you're going long, you're going short, or you're planning to short, let's say, but uh, you're seeing like both markets are just moving up in the last five minutes, it's just been moving up. Well, maybe it's not the ideal time to go for short, right? So yeah, using the market correlations coming back to that again, I think that could definitely be one important element when when to know wh how to adjust your stops and how to be able to you know uh, manage your risk. Yeah, man, I get you on all that. With um, when it comes to you know understanding when you're in the flow of things. Is there anything that you tend to do maybe like before the market even opens to prepare yourself? Well, I mean, personally, I, I, I need something to stimulate me. I can't, I can't just like, oh, uh, uh, come in, open the screens and then, okay, let's see what we're going to do. I, I need coffee. I need water. You know, I need to really kind of like, you know, embrace the, uh, the fact that it's just early in the morning or, you know, it's probably not the best time to, you know, uh, calm down. I personally don't like to really calm down. I like just meditate, all that stuff. That doesn't work for me. Okay. Uh, I kind of need my coffee. I need to be stimulated. And, uh, the fact that psychologically, I know that the market, uh, I have basically no, um, I have no power on the market. I have basically market doesn't care who I am or how many months I'm trading or whatever. 
that's my approach. I, I just need to be there, stimulate myself, have my coffee, my water, and then, like, you know, dictate, let's see how we trade. And then my initial uh, trades will generally be very, like, tight, tight ones. I'll, I'll go get four, six, eight kicks just to see how I manage them. And the, the risks, again, are very low. I think at the end of the day, each individual has to have a perspective of the market that, you know, us, the market could do basically anything, right? They could go down 10 points within the first, first minute of the market, regardless of your bias. You could, have, you could have been looking for longs and it's still going to go down 10, 15 points. You don't know that and you have no control over that. So basically, I always just at least make sure that I know when there's news coming out. If there's any news in the next 15 minutes, you know, when market opens or if there's news at 10 a.m., let's say, well, the first 30 minutes, I know that most likely we'll have like a, an e- I won't say easy market, but a market that is kind of like predictable. So I could like b- basically trade for a good 30 minutes there and not have to have some kind of news that interferes with my, my entries. You get it? Right. And so then... What do you do when there is just like out of the blue news and you see, you know, the, the book starting to thin and mark conditions are trying to shift? How do you adapt mm-hmm. quickly to that? Well, if, if I'm in a trade, I'll try to get the hell out. By the way, I'll take, you know, whatever. <laughs> if it's a loss, it's a loss. If it's a, if it's a gain, it's there. But I mean, if it's in my direction, perfect. Uh, I won't worry about, uh, I missed, I let, I left 20 points on the table on a NASDAQ trade when the thing went up 60 points within five minutes, you know, that's the kind of con- things I can't control. You understand? So uh, I need to really focus. I mean, I think traders have to really focus on what they could control. If you're not, you're, if you're not, uh, if you're trading like a gambler, right? So you're just you know, putting money in a slot machine or uh, whatever the casino there. Uh, I hate those kind of analogies, but you know, that's how it is, right? A lot of people have this analogy with uh, trading is like, you have to be the casino. You have to be, you know, the, you have to be the machine that kind of, it's not, it's not how that works. We're, we're just basic retail traders. We have basically no, no uh, effect on the market. So for me, it's all about how I manage my trades and I'm planning to take what, 15, 20 trades a day. And some traders are going to, oh my God, 15, 20, 20 trades a day. That's huge. That's a lot. But for me, that's like a normal day, you know? And then a very quiet day will be like if I take five trades, and that's probably because I have other stuff to do that day. And I'm not able to trade, but on a, on a regular day, fifteen twenty trades is kind of my 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 normal day, you know. Yeah, and so you know, continuing the fact that twenty twenty brought a lot of volatility to the markets, was there any point, maybe even this year, that? Mm-hmm you really got into it. You just, you were full on, you had the flow and it's something that I know people can go to your channel and they can check up past videos. Do you know any specific periods of time that might've been in? Cause uh, people well, love to see all those, you know, I mean, if you, if you look at my trading and again, uh, the way I trade, it's basically the flow of what's going on right now. Right. I mean, uh, I have a, a couple of trade setups where I'm looking for either a market that's, you know, you know one sided where I'm just looking for, you know, pullbacks and to be able to enter. Uh, I like to kind of have um, a slight, let's say, uh, way to monitor mar- mar- NASDAQ and ES with, with the tape, you know. Uh, there's what we call value on tape. There's always an area where buyers and sellers are kind of agreeing and everyone's happy. You've got retail, you've got the one lots going through. You're like, okay, this is kind of the area where if we get a move out of here, this is my bias to either, you know, if it's going to move lower from here, I'm going to look for shorts because both markets are kind of like extended and both are moving in, in correlation. Understand? So the way you could kind of like uh, define that is a market that's in a channel, right? Everyone kind of like sees this channel that's going up. It's a trend line. It's uh, the market's just going up and down. It's very clear on a basic trend line. The thing is, that's the kind of market where you could basically play both sides because you have, you know, you can buy the, the low of the channel. You can sell the high of the channel. Technically speaking, that's, that's how it works. But on tape, that's exactly how you're spotting value, you know? 
So, I mean, uh, every day is kind of the same way I trade. It's just that uh, I'm quick to, a lot of traders will say, like, you're quick to, like, scratch. You, you know that this trade was probably not going to work out. Even if it gave maybe a, a two or three tick winner, I'm willing to scratch that trade. And again, I try not to get into too much trouble. And I think when I look at the way other traders trade, because sometimes I'll, I'll ask the trader, like, go ahead, like, do, do some recording, just send it to me and let, let's see, you know, go, go put it on YouTube and let's see how you trade. Uh, the first thing I notice is most traders are constantly hitting the market. They're like, they're okay, I'm, I'm going to go long. I hit the market and then it comes back six, eight ticks and he should have probably waited for that. And that's the kind of little uh, things that I think a lot of traders need to work because it's not always about hitting the market and just going in because the flow is, it's, it's bullish, you know, uh, let, let the market come to you, right? So the first exercise I think a lot of traders should do is the market is trading, let's say, 39.60, put an order at 39.67, three points lower, four points lower. Is the market coming to you? You know, if the market constantly comes back to you, it's, I mean, as an order for a trader, as a tape, tape trader, you know that it's the kind of market that's just going to be like buy the pullbacks or sell the pullbacks, you know? So you, you kind of need to let the market come to you. And that's where a lot of traders are always getting into trouble because they're constantly, okay, this is like super bullish and they're always going to hit the market. So that's the kind of thing I, I test myself with when I'm trading on Dome. And sometimes on the, on the recordings, you'll see how, like if the market's trading 39.60, I'll just put an order at 39.58. Wait a bit, you know, give it, give it a minute. If it's not even coming back to me, it's probably because this thing still has some, a couple, of, couple of legs that will go higher. Okay. Was that clear? Yeah, it was very clear, sir. No problem. <laughs> right. <laughs> when it comes to, you know, those kind of sessions where maybe not everything's lining up, do you still stick it out to make a certain daily goal? Or nah. You'll still stick this it out? Is, I mean, I'll try. <laughs> I think <laughs> the whole point of going on your on your chair and trading that day is not to lose money, right? You're not planning to lose money because everyone wants to everyone wants to make money, right? I'd want to but see then, the person that plans to lose. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Exactly. So, I mean, the whole point is at least go get 250, 150, 500, whatever. I actually posted uh, a day on Twitter, I think, if I'm not mistaken, it was, in, it was in August, where I had like eight trades that day, or eight, eight or ten trades. I had like six, seven good trades, and then I had one bad trade, but that like, kind of screwed the whole thing, right? It was like, man... I was up like 400, 500, whatever, and then one trade comes in and your day is break even, back to break even, you know? So that day, I remember very well, I kind of did, okay, call it a day, you know? It, it's the kind of thing that, I mean, we're human, psychologically, we get affected. So I think, I mean, it, this could be a good thing or a bad thing, which is really relative to each individual. My point is to make money every day. If I can't, if I've made already 800, 700, 1,000 dollars this day, why should I try to force it? And I'm already at my eight or 10 trades of the day, let's say. And again, the way I trade, it's generally looking for that momentum in the first hour, right? I think the initial balance is kind of like, if you're a trader who wants to learn how to trade and you want to master one time, like one specific period of the day, just go in, do your recordings on the first hour of each day. Learn how to trade the first initial balance and call it a day because... Uh, some days you'll have Fed speakers and from 11, from the Euro, Euro close to like maybe in the afternoon, it'll be total chop. It'll go up four or five points, come back down four or five points. And you kind of like lost the directionality of that day. So I think having to learn how to trade the first initial balance and mastering that time period, uh, you'll kind of like save yourself from doing like unwanted stupid trades. Yeah, I mean, some people consider this as like a complete day job, but it should be something that gets you away from having a day job, you know? Yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, a lot of traders that I've met in the last, you know, I could say uh, perhaps that I've helped or discussed with maybe uh, 250 traders in the last, you know, years. Uh, all these traders are, are always looking for like a specific time to trade. Uh, either it's 3 a.m. London because the guy uh, has a daytime job or... He's only willing to trade in the, in the gold session or whatever. 
I think the the period that's like the most consistent and the volume is there, the flow of the market is pretty easy to kind of, again, this is coming from me who has domes and tapes and I see this every day, right? You can't expect to have this consistency if you're just only trading on a chart, right? I, that's how I see it. I think chart traders uh, don't have all the information that's required when you're trading, you know? So if, if you're going to have some kind of consistency, learn to trade the first initial balance, keep it at that and call it a day. You made money, you made money, you lost it, you lost it. If you're, if you close the deal with a break even, maybe 1 to 3 p.m. is like another period where I'll, I'll try to trade, maybe perhaps 1.30 to 3 p.m. But after that, uh, some traders like to trade the, the close. I mean, the close has no consistency. It could be totally random from one day to another. So uh, that's how I approach it. And when it comes to your approach, um, let's talk into the fact that this year we're facing a lot of talk around like interest rates and now you trade some bonds, but they also affect mm -hmm. equities. Is there anything you do to prepare ahead of time, like maybe to position yourself for these large moves? Well, I, I think um, one thing with trading is that you kind of have to have, you know, you, you have to acknowledge that you can't be good at everything. You can't be good at trading the bonds when there's news. You can't be good at new trading every news event. So for me, if I know that there's news coming out, like CPI the other day, right? We had the, the news there. I wasn't in front of the screens because that day I had an appointment with my daughter. But I mean, if you go back and look at the, look at the, the recording I have, it was not, unless you were short, right? Unless you were like, short or if you really had that short bias with that news coming out uh there was no other way to trade it the the market was just all over the place like my domes were not even keeping pace with the huge volatility you had so if you have any kind of edge in trading news it's perhaps knowing that if the cpi number was going to shock like that you have a bearish you have a bearish bias right but i mean being able to trade that it was almost impossible. So I, I kind of like stopped thinking of always trading news. I kind of see it as like, okay, there's news coming up, coming out. Uh, if I'm not ready on a fundamental basis, I don't even know what the Michigan CPI number is and what they're expecting. But I know that the news is coming out at 10 a.m. Let's say I'll just avoid being in a trade at that time. So, I mean, I'll, like most really good traders will have positions when they're there's news but we're retail we don't need to be you know we don't, we don't need to always trade the news uh just go with what you've got in front of you i think the momentum is the main aspect here if you see momentum one-sided try to see if you can capture a couple of trades in the direction of that momentum and that's pretty much it yeah best way for it to settle down a bit otherwise you're kind of kind of exactly. gambling <laughs> yeah definitely definitely yeah um and so what kind of puts apart we'll say gamblers from maybe true traders is that ability to review yourself you know to understand like okay this is a process that i have mm -hmm. and how do you go about sort of debriefing yourself if you debrief well, yourself well my debriefing is really having my recordings every day and my goal is to record the whole day because let's say i'm I wasn't there for the afternoon, but, you know, some kind of news or Biden was talking in the afternoon. I want to see how the market traded at that time. And in the future, the, the best way is to really record your screens. And every time I tell traders, the best way to learn is not watching e-mini trade, is not watching someone else trade. It's to see how you trade. Like, I've watched recordings of my summer summer in the last couple of weeks uh, summertime here and august was really one heck of a weird month you know it was like good volatility one day and then chop the next day good volatility one day and then chop the next day and i didn't trade a lot of august but one thing for sure now is that i think most of the months of august going forward i will basically take vacation because i find that there's no consistency uh I'm not able to really make the easy trades that I generally do on in the month of August. So 
reviewing myself with the recordings is the best way and actually kind of kind of putting the trades uh the videos in, on my trades on youtube basically kind of i that's what i'm kind of inciting traders to do i think everyone needs to do that and you know again a lot of key statistics around win rate and how much you know how many trades you take a day, per day and at least you know your win rate has to be 50 percent because i don't know a lot of traders who have 80 90 percent win rates and they're doing great you know you have to have losers and you need to learn to manage those losers so that i mean keep a consistency on the win rate is pretty much how i define uh reviewing my my trades per day Oh, yeah, for sure. I feel that sometimes when, you know, beginning the career, you kind of don't want to take any losers because you feel like, oh, man, that's going to make me a terrible trader. But the ability to take that loss and just move on frees you yeah. up. It just frees you up so well. Definitely. All right. So being that, you know, you've been around Futures for about, I think, 16 years from what you told me the 2006. Yeah. And you have all these uh, recordings and you debrief yourself and you watch yourself. Is there still any big flaws that you're currently working on? I think the main flaw and a lot of traders tell me, man, you could have hold, you could have held on to that one, you know? Uh, like everything was there, everything, all the stars were aligning. Why didn't you hold to that? Hold on to that trade. That's where, you know, perfecting, you know, knowing yourself uh, maybe the psychological part of you know i've done let's say 10 trades already i'm on my 11th i'm up a thousand dollars what i tend to do is my next trade i kind of like okay if it if it hits eight ticks or whatever i'll i'll just take the profit and close the day you know and then that's the trade that went like a good 20 ticks higher <laughs> you understand what i mean so i, I hope i mean at least when it comes to risk management, I know that, man, this, this thing is already against me. Eight, ten ticks. Uh, I was talking about ES, let's say, and you're already down like 100, 150. I already know that this thing is not going to get better. I'm trying to already cut this thing, you know? I'll try to already cut it at break even or even take the 50 or $100, or $100 $150 loss. So when it comes to managing trades, you're never going to be perfect. You're never going to always have that 20 tick mover in ES, which is your five, five points, right? And again, if you're able to keep, like, if you're able to always consistently hit five point uh, moves on ES, that's probably because you're letting the, the, the trade play out and, you know, you're really in that trade for at least five to 10 minutes. You understand what I mean? Because the way I trade is what's the market doing now? Should I be going along? How we're, how we're doing the markets correlating with ES here. Uh, and in the last 10 minutes, we've seen rotations of like six to eight ticks. Like at some point, this thing's going to change. The thing is, when is it going to change? I have no idea. So my best odd trade is to either take six, eight, 10 tick winners or losses consistently. And then there's always this one trade that con just goes on and you'll capture a couple of those once in a while. You know, I think that's the flaw where you're never going to, as an order flow tape and don't trade, or you're, no, you're never always going to hit those big winners, you know? All right. I'm going to humanize you a little bit. Uh, I'm sure from the videos you have on your YouTube, it doesn't go the farthest back to the beginning of your journey, of course. But at oh, no, any obviously not. <laughs> what was the worst trade? Yeah. You know. uh well yeah Let, let's let's start with the worst trade okay <laughs> because yeah uh, obviously since 2006 you know i i could say there was a good two to three years where like it was i was up two or three thousand per month the next month i would lose a lot another four thousand and then i'd make a couple of couple of grand in the next month and then i'll lose it again the consistency really took me to the two to three years okay let's let's be very honest it's you're you're here learning something that's a skill and then you're also learning how you personally you manage money you manage trades and the, all that emotional stuff so if we come to emotions i think as a trader if you know that you have specific days where like man it's just not my day i'm like super excited or 
I'm super down, let's say, maybe just don't trade that day, right? So if I do the analogy with the day that I traded, which was like in 2000, if I'm not mistaken, it was like 13 or 15. I can't, I can't remember exactly, but it was my birthday. It was the 1st of September. That's my birthday. And it was one day where I totally screwed up. <laughs> I, I lost like 18 grand that day. Uh, I was just revenge trading. And uh, I, I had come back from like a couple of good months of like good, good trades. You know, I had basically, I, cut, I had several months of really good consistent gains. And that one day, it was my birthday, I'm super hyped, you know, it's like, you know, I'm getting presents and we're supposed to have the whole family friends that, that evening. I screwed up. I basically revenge traded. I let losing trades go against me too far. And I screwed a couple of months of good gains that day. And I can't even describe how terrifying it was because... Especially if you're in a good consistency for three, four months, and then you have that one bad day that screws everything. Uh, that was like the worst birthday nightmare of all times. I think I've never really gotten over that day. And that's why most uh, years on my birthday now, I never trade. Uh, I did this year. I, I had a pretty good day. I actually put it on YouTube because I was, I was kind of happy. But uh, there's this streak with my birthdays that I hate. And I just can't trade now on my birthdays. It's it's rare that I'll have decent, uh, good trades that that day, and I I just avoid it completely. Ah, uh, yeah. I mean, I think there's an important lesson there. Is just you gotta understand what days to take off. You know, you don't have to participate every day. That's it. I mean, you have 20 days a month. Let's say average, right? You've got 12 months. So that's like over 200 days per. Year. You know, you have enough days to trade right i mean and especially if you're taking this job as a you know taking it seriously you're not a gambler you know that you know we're retail we, we don't have an edge really in trading so you, you want to make sure that you're really taking the best days and like all everything has to kind of align you don't you don't want to be trading on days where psychologically you're not doing well or you know you've got other issues to solve and you're there like trying to take your couple of trades to, to make 200 bucks and then you end up losing 500 you know it, it's you have to really understand how you you are personally and again this is really difficult because each person is totally different for me uh, like risk management wise again even risk or taking profits it's very relative i don't like losing 500 dollars but uh, i'm very happy making 200 i'm very happy making a thousand and I don't like losing a thousand dollars, you know. And some traders like their threshold is like, ah, if I if I don't make five thousand, uh, I don't call that a good day. I have trader buddies that have that kind of mentality. For me, it's just like every day is not the same. So if I'm consistently making five hundred to a thousand per day, I'm very happy. At least not, you know, over trading some some days and trying to make back money that you lost throughout the week and. Come back, you come on a Friday and it's the last day of the day and the market's super choppy. You have to know where you have to cut it, you know? Yeah, I mean, people romanticize uh, trading. You'll see videos with like catch grabbing uh, thumbnails like, oh, make 2K a day. Every day. <laughs> Regardless, yeah. news, not even then, 2K a day. Yeah, there's a specific pattern that you just have to take every day, whatever. And, you know, I mean, at, at a certain level, I could understand, but like you'll eat any statistic or anything in, in trading, anything pretty much in in any level, it's not 100%. You'll always have that 10, 15, 20% margin of error, you know, and that will be one day where you have this specific pattern or whatever that works, and that day it doesn't, you know, it's because you, you don't have any control over that. And then let's let's try to live things back up. Uh, what happened to be the best day you had in trading? I, I mean, I can't remember the exact day, but I think it was in 2020, August. I, I posted it on Twitter somewhere. I can't even find it myself. I had like a huge day. It was one of those days where like, I think we were coming off a couple of days of like, you know, where the market had pulled back and I think we had like one of those huge 2020 rallies, if you remember, 
how that period was uh, within the pandemic. It was in August 2020 where I, I believe I, I, I made over 16K that day. I mean, if, if I remember, like, de de deducting the commissions and whatever, it was like over 16, 16K. And it was one, or it's probably one of the best days. And, and talking about that runner that you keep, right? I had this runner that I basically took at the open and it just continued going up. I think there was like two red turns on a five minute trip that day. Like I remember it very well. And then like, I'm not here to say, oh, look, made this much per day or this much that day. I can't say it was luck, but it was just one day where like totally huge reversal. I think the Dow Jones had made over like a thousand points that day. NASDAQ was over like 800. Like, ES was up at least 4% that day. It was like a huge day, you know? And again, one of those days where it probably, I am not sure, but it probably won't happen again. You know, I probably won't capture those kind of days again. I don't know. I mean, I always consider trading uh, mostly luck. I mean, it's always down to controlling yourself, of course. That's it. But then, it. you know, if you notice oh, you know what? Luck is on my side today. Let it run, you know? And it seems like yeah. you got that opportunity. Definitely. I mean, I, I, coming back to days where, like, you know, if they're taking 10, I, like, for myself, I'm taking 10, 15, 20 trades a day, and I'd say I'm really on a run. Like, it's been my ninth trade, and it's, like, eight green, eight winners. I know that that day I'm just reading the market perfectly, right? So that's probably the kind of day where I'll, I'll kind of hit a bit more, and I'll try to really use that advantage uh compared to a day where like i'll take three losses in a row okay let's see what the heck's going on here do we do i have to go hit uh hit the coffee machine go get another coffee or what's going on you know that's kind of like these little signals intraday that you need to have or else uh you'll always be a, you know kind of entitled to take trades because you're seeing a setup or whatever on the chart but it's i think i've done five trades and three of them are losers so there's obviously something that's not working here, you know? <laughs> For sure. Um, and it's funny, though. When I had first started trading, one of my buddies actually, I think, was taught by you a bit. Oh, yeah. I, I think I know who that is, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And, you know, a lot of this information that was shown to him, you know, it comes mm -hmm. off and we speak on it. So, I, I mean, indirectly, I've learned a couple of things from you. Definitely. I mean, uh, I mean, I, I'm not here to say I'm the best. I know what I'm doing and, you know, just rely on what I do. Just, you know, it's that's not how it works because at the end of the day, each individual has to kind of like set up his own style and really like know what his flaws are and... I think helping out a lot of traders, uh, most of them come back because there's this new thing where like, oh, my psychology, I have to work on my psychology, right? Well, let's just give this example where I have to work on my psychology because, you know, it's, it's just not working. I'm, I'm not doing this. And then the first question I ask them is, well, do you do your recording? Do you record your, your trading and all that? Oh, I don't do that. Well, why don't you? And then it's like, okay, well, I'll start. You know, sometimes it's it's easy to say it's my psychology, it's this. Uh, I need to go take, you know, go watch, uh, what's his name, Mark Douglas videos on YouTube. I have no, nothing against it. But before really, you know, expecting that your psychology is the problem, learn how, what your flaws are when you're trading. Is it because you're being too aggressive? Uh, again, I'll pinpoint a couple of aspects that I look at is how, how, how aggressive are you? Are you always like, going into the market just because the market just moved four or five ticks and I have to be, I have to bullet, I have to go, I have to go off. You, you know, it's all this little, these little nuances sometimes. And are you totally biased on some kind of price that you saw on Twitter? That's another thing. Uh, you know, now, nowadays on social media, you have like 15, 20 guys giving all kinds of levels and they're pretty much, you know, all these levels are pretty much very close to each other. I, I do that too sometimes, you know, but at the end of the day, is it because, or below 39 whatever that you have to be short and then the market just rallies well why did it rally you know that's where i think uh, coming back to um learning from each other kind of having you know a community where you know you're able to see how others trade 
and what did they see and what made them take that trade and then sometimes you're just like man that guy took the trade there because he probably saw that number on Twitter you know because uh, in my perspective there was basically no trade to take there you know you understand what I mean oh I understand for sure <laughs> I mean uh, I don't know how how many years you've been trading have you been trading I think you're, you're mostly a bond trader right ah uh, man not getting too much into all that, but it's been about four years that I would consider like effective, um, daily, effective learning. You know, I I I would say like I made a turning point into dom trading about four years ago. The rest mm -hmm. of that, like stocks, indicator following, I I don't even consider that anymore. I don't consider yeah. that part of me actually being mm -hmm. ex like. That doesn't add into my experience. I get you. I mean, uh, coming to stocks, it's like, uh, you know, when some traders are like, oh, I, I trade stocks, I trade futures, I do this. And I, I really, really respect these guys, but you can't master everything. I mean, uh, these guys who are trading penny stocks or, you know, low float stocks and whatever, whatnot, you go back and you check what they trade and they trade those kind of stocks every time, every day. So probably they have some kind of an edge or they kind of, you know, they have this pattern that they're looking for, which I totally respect, right? But when you come, when they come to trade futures, they're, really, they're like, oh, no, I don't know what the hell, I don't know what the hell to do, you know? So that's another thing that, should I trade options? Should I trade stocks? What should I trade, right? And I've done them all. <laughs> uh, I've made huge home run trades with options, but I've also lost a ton of money with options, you know? And then... And if, especially if you don't have a specific pattern that you're looking for with options, or I think unless you're always buying options, or you're selling depending on what the strategy is, but there's, there's a lot to be, you know, analyzed when to trade stocks and what kind of stocks, large cap, small cap, you know, and that's another thing that a lot of young traders come into. They, they tell me like, how did you start? Well, I started with stocks and I'm telling you, I had my case script, you know, it's because you had this market that was a super easy to go along back in 2009 or 2008, as you had dips, you would just buy the dip and the market would just continue going hotter. And it was just really easy. But then came 2011, 2013, we had like Greece, debt, the Chinese yuan issues and the volatility picked up. So if we go back like 10, 15 years ago, this volatility that we're having today, we had that kind of this kind of volatility back then too you know markets don't really change at huge extreme levels you know it's just certain products certain stocks or certain you know like the futures back then es and es was totally huge there was huge liquidity you would have 500 600 on on each bid and offer you know and i can't say i was an excellent i was i was excellent at trading that because it it was it, was, it wasn't really fun there wasn't enough volatility some days you know and back then, even the bonds were super thick. So, yes, certain things change without the year, within the years, but a lot of the concepts are still the same. Nothing really changes when it comes to should I, you know, kind of be a dip buyer or look for sales intraday? Are we balanced? Are we imbalanced? You know, the, the same kind of stuff. You just have to, I think, perfect uh, your entries and be able to adapt intraday because intraday things could change very quickly nowadays especially with news that's coming out and we're so informed there's like so much social media compared to back then i i can't even remember back then like how social media would affect the market you know nowadays small kind of news could could move the market within five ten minutes it'll be super volatile back then it was just mainly oh are we are we still continuing with quantitative easing or how is Greece going to do with their debt? How is Europe going to cope? And then you come to today, it's just all about interest rates and central banks. I mean, hey, the worst, the most important thing, of course, we, regardless of all those kind of news events or Twitters or whatever it is, mm -hmm. it should just be working on your skills, you know? That's it. That's it. Build your skill set, build your style, forget about whatever you're going to see on Twitter 
Maybe even forget about what you see on your own <laughs> like YouTube channel if people watch. There's no way they're going to be able to, to know exactly what made you enter those trades. Because for a lot of experienced traders, it kind of just becomes like, uh, oh, I just felt it. You know, I, I've been watching this long enough that I kind of felt mm -hmm. I could enter here. That's it. You know, one, one trade I did today was uh, uh, I think NASDAQ was going up. It had like just broken the, the opening range. And, and then I, I kind of saw that it had a hard time going through a certain level. So I said to myself, I'll try to leg into a couple of ES trades here and man. The thing just it just swept down like eight i think it was like eight ticks like within a second so that was one trade that you know i'll take maybe ten, nine, nine times out of ten and i know that the expectancy of the outcome should definitely at least give me 50 bucks you know at least four ticks yeah i hope to see that video up soon then <laughs> well I, I try to you know because again I think I, I recorded yesterday, which was September 13th. I did the whole day's session. And then a lot of traders tell me, like, oh, please, like, upload it. I, I actually watch the whole thing. Like, I tell them, look, just, well, just watch the first initial balance. I think that's the best time to learn and see how dome tape and all that works. And I just put the whole thing sometimes. And a lot of traders were like, oh, my God, it's like eight hours. So why don't you don't have to watch the whole thing, you know? <laughs> That's how I kind of started with YouTube. It was really just like me, uh, as you could probably see, like my old videos, like the quality was less. You know, I kind of have to adapt. You learn too. You know, these are kind of things that I'm not, I'm not an expert in. You know, and my previous old recordings not all that great. And I had to, I had to, I had to improve. So, but now, especially now, my recordings are, I, I find tremendous. I mean, <laughs> the, the quality is great, and you're able to see everything movements and. I record every day and I just don't post the whole thing, the whole thing every day, but uh, that's how I got into YouTube. And then, you know, it's obviously just too bad that I didn't have sessions from 2015 or 2018 or back from 2020 that I kept because at some point you don't keep everything. But uh, that's how I got into YouTube. And then from there, uh, I built like you know, a good community where we're able to learn from each other. And that's pretty much it. I, keep it, I try to keep it real. I mean, I know that it's not perfect. I try to put every every um, trade I do on the funded accounts there too. And at the end of the day, uh, I'll trade. Uh, I'll do a couple of trades on my brokerage account with Sierra Charge, but I I, re I rarely put those trades on because I don't do a lot of trades on the brokerage account with ES or Nasdaq. I'll do mostly bonds with those with that one. So I try to keep it real and you know and. If I'm able to make it, I'm not saying I'm perfect and I'm not saying I'm the best or whatever, but I mean, it, 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 just have that consistency. Learn from, you know, from your, from your, from your way of trading, learn from your recordings. And that's pretty much what I have to say. So if people wanted to find you, I mean, I'm sure not everyone who ends up watching this might even know who you were, but where would they yeah. find you? Well, I have my YouTube channel. I have Twitter. Uh, you could just Twitter if you put it on Twitter. It's Emilio's there. And uh, I mainly have all my contact information under every video that I do on YouTube. So you could just also share that. I think, uh, I mean, for me as a future trader, I my plan, my my goal is to just inspire others to like, look, you can do this. It's not. It's not super difficult. You don't need to have a master's degree in finance. Uh, you just have to, you know, build a skill and have certain uh, patterns that you see on a daily basis and have the statistical edge behind you to say that, look, 10 traders, 10, 10 traders out of, I mean, eight traders out, eight trades out of 10, you'll end up making at least some kind of profit. And if that day you're not doing well, we'll just call it a day and you'll restart the next day. That's what's cool about trading is that every day is different. And and I think that's the kind of thing that kind of always gets traders, in, in, you know, enthusiastic. And, uh, they're really like into futures because every day is different and it's a new start, right? Uh, and uh, that's pretty much it. Uh, and if you're into trading for like a lifestyle, right? Like all the glamorous, like, oh my God, I make this much money per day or whatever videos that you see on social media. Well, one thing for sure, 
I've been doing this so long that I haven't made a million dollars in any year. You get what I mean? It's not like, uh, and again, it's relative. I don't need to make a million a year. You understand? So all, a lot of youngsters are like, oh my God, futures, you know, trading, you can make so much money. You know? I think that aspect has to really be very clear, clear that that's not the first goal when you get into trading. It's, it's a passion. It's, you know, I think at the end, it's really a passion. You have to really like this job. Yeah, and you know, speaking back to like uh, that friend of mine, mm -hmm. do you still offer those kind of services? Well, like basically doing one on ones, understanding how you know the, the trader is, tr the, how he trades, how I could give him like you know certain clues in trading the dome and the tape. I still do one on one coachings, and I I think uh, the best thing is actually. When I offer these services, I tell them like, go get some go get some recordings. I want to see how you trade. You know, let's let's emphasize, let's work on what your style of trading. If your style of trading is super aggressive, you're always constantly looking for a trade, and you notice that within fifteen to thirty minutes of a recording, I could decipher the psychology of a trader like very quickly. You'll see it. You you understand that this trader is just like he's out there to just make make trades all day long and i think uh, we really, really touch upon it a lot but that's the main reason a lot of these prop firms you know make a lot of money because there's this psychological thing behind going and getting that target and you know having that certain number of trades per day or a number of days traded right i think all that if you don't manage it, if you don't have enough discipline, it's definitely going to affect you. So coming to those firms, I think they're great. You could give them all a try. And there's many, there are many videos that I explain where, which ones I use and all that on my YouTube channel. But you have to understand that it's not about a target, not about a number of day, the trades or a number of days that you trade. It's about building your skill. So instead of putting up real capital, you will try, use those evaluations, use those prop firms, but you know, you have to be, you still have to keep this as a real uh, job. You can't just put on trades and wish that it works out because, you know, you, you need to get to that target today before resetting. And I think this, these, these are kind of flaws that a lot of traders have. I, I met this trader who, he did like 15 resets a day. <laughs> if you're doing 15 resets per day, there's a problem here. You know, it's, uh, I can't help you with that. <laughs> you understand? You, you, you've got some kind of a gambling issue. You've got this psychological issue that's definitely not helping you. You know, you have to have this, this discipline of, if I'm going to take five, 10 trades today, I'll do it on my prop firm account, whatever, and call it a day. Try to really not over trade and try to get that target just to get funded and then lose the funded account after two because you've got no process. You've got, you haven't built that skill. And if you want a time frame, I think the best time to really, like the amount of time you need to really build a skill, minimum three to six months. If a trader comes to me and he's like, yeah, I've been trading for you know three, mo uh, three months now and I've been doing this and that and it's working. Well, you've probably not gained enough experience. Yet. You know, coming back to that analogy where you, when you do something for like 10,000 hours or whatever, whatever, that's how trading is more you spend time in front of that screen, it, it's not about spending time per day, but it's about the, the the months, the years of experience that you have that will help you. Yeah, your your buddy there was a bit crazy. That's that's insanity. The literal oh, yeah. definition 15, of insanity. Yeah, yeah, 15 to 20 resets a day. I mean, I'm like, okay, well, how do you expect me to help you here? We've got an issue that's that's totally... You know, it's not, you know, you need to solve that first, you know? All right. I think that's a fun story to probably start to uh, taper off on. Thank you again for your time. I appreciate uh, it. Of course, for everyone out there, pleasure. it was a great pleasure. All right. So we'll keep in touch and uh, wishing you guys uh, happy trading. Uh, don't hesitate to contact me or email me or even message me on Twitter. Uh, I'm very, you know, eagerly willing to help anyone possible. And uh, again, I really want to thank 
constantly for his uh, for his uh, you know his his channel as well. He he does a great job of uh, demonstrating certain things that I think is very important, and uh, hopefully uh, we'll do other sessions together at some point. Oh, I'm videos sure that we can collaborate. People are going to be definitely curious off of this one. They're going to want to see like, okay, let's get into the specifics. They want to see your trading <laughs> screen at some point, I'm sure. Or a nice little lesson. But again, till then, i catch you up. Thank you. As always, guys, thanks for watching our video. Don't forget to like and subscribe and leave some comments for future videos.